is one of our themes for this year is to tell the story of Jesus. And in doing that, we know that there are going to be people among us who maybe have never encountered Jesus, maybe never have actually studied the teachings of Jesus. But you come into an assembly such as this because you're seeking to have the right relationship with Jesus. And we're going to be using that word a lot tonight, that word relationship with Jesus. The reason being is because it is something that I think is very common today, is being heard a lot, is that idea of a relationship with Jesus. And as was read for us a few moments ago from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 23, the idea of being able to have boldness, to come into the presence of God, to have complete confidence, to not be afraid or, or weary or reluctant in any shape, form, or fashion. And I think for most of us, that's something that might be a little bit um, uncommon or unnatural for us. But it's probably the thing that we're always looking for, is to have that real closeness that some seem to have. They seem to be spiritual. Maybe it's a term that we sometimes use. And so some of the teaching and preaching that we will often hear today is the idea of choosing. That if you had to choose between being the kind of person who is always doing exactly what it is that God has for you to do, that you're trying your best to keep all the commandments of God, that you're trying to be loyal to the doctrine of Jesus Christ, However, your heart just isn't there. If you had to choose between that and being the kind of person whose heart is very, very devoted to Jesus, you feel very close to Jesus, you have a spiritual relationship with Jesus, however, you're not doing things exactly the way that God says to do them, which would you rather be? And I've heard that in many sermons recently, and it's very disturbing because both of those extremes are wrong. It's not an either or that you're choosing one that would be wrong and the other that would be right. Those are both incorrect. The Bible talks about us having the ability to come before God with boldness and having hope within us. That a person who is obeying the commandments of God and his heart is not in it, he's not right with God no more than the person who believes that he's very, very close to God and yet he keeps none of his commandments. Neither of those are right with God. And so really what we're going to be talking about tonight is what then is the relationship between obedience and relationship itself with Jesus Christ? What's the role that obedience plays in that? Because I think it's a very important lesson that many seem to be forgetting in our day and time. So that's what we're going to be looking at. So if you're ready for the three words to see the notebooks tonight. Very, very cool. All right, here's your three words for tonight. Relationship, obedience, as we're talking about just a moment ago, and also selfishness. I appreciate the song that Aaron led tonight. It was actually why I used that word selfishness tonight, was because that song does start out from a place of, of selfishness. And so when we talk about relationship and obedience, this is what we're really looking at. Do you want your relationship with Jesus Christ to be based upon what you want or based upon what he wants? Because that's really what it comes down to. Do you want your closeness, your nearness, your spiritual walk with Jesus to come down to what it is that you want in that walk or what he wants more, what he expects in that walk? That's where it really comes down to. We need to understand that we are flesh and blood and we are created beings. We are created in the image of God and we are created for a very specific purpose, to fear God and keep his commandments. Our sins have separated us from God. They have cast such a wide dispersion between he and us that there is no way for us to cross that gulf on our own. The only way that we have access to God, the only means of our salvation is because of Jesus Christ. And I believe that I sit in the midst of a group of people this evening who want desperately to know God personally, intimately, to know him as much as they possibly can and to be as close to him as they possibly can. We desire and, and look into what has been sacrificed for us, and we desire to want to somehow make up for the wrongs that we have. But intellectually, we know that there's no way that we can. And so our desire sometimes overrides the ability, I think, for us to, to realize what does God ask of us and what is it that God wants? What does it mean to truly love God? And so as we look at that great distance between us, knowing that God has given us very specific applications to our lives that we can use to know how our relationship is with him. Let's, let's notice a few of those. What about the idea, even just first and foremost, of knowing God? What does that mean to you? What do you think that means when you first hear that? Do you know God? Or for those of us who are Christians, 
What do you want to know? Do you know God? How do you know that you know God? The scriptures doesn't leave us doubting about that. Some people believe that they know God because of a feeling, an emotion that is there, some kind of emotional desire and love for him. And that can be a good thing in many ways, but that's not what the Bible describes as knowing him. Instead, in 1 John 2 and verse 3, it says this, Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says that I know him and does not keep his commandments, John says is a liar and the truth is not in him. If we talk about knowing God, it's about knowing what it is that he expects. It is about knowing his nature. It is knowing about his love, his will, his mercy, who he is and his character. That if I'm keeping the commandments of God, it's because I know him and I know who God is. I know his way is best. I know his love is right. I know that his character is sound. I know everything about him is perfect and complete. And so to know God means I need to be keeping his commandments because that's what they were given for, is to help our lives conform to the very image of his son. Another passage that we have in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, that there will be many that says to Jesus, Lord, Lord, these, he says, will not enter the kingdom of heaven, but it's the one who does the will of his Father in heaven. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So the person who practices lawlessness is not keeping the commandments of God. Not only does John say that that person does not know God, but in Matthew we see God does not know them. Even though they have all these characteristics in their life that make it sound like they do know him. And have done many wonderful things and did many wonderful things in Jesus' name. But Jesus says you are acting without authority. You are practicing that which is lawlessness. I don't know you. And so when we th start talking about that relationship of actually knowing Jesus Christ, of knowing God, obedience is key. Obedience is central to knowing God. What about another one? Let's think about what it means then to love God. I think all of us would agree that loving God is something that the Bible even specifically commands, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Other verses uh, also include with all your strength. This is something that we even find in the Old Testament, that as Jesus, as uh, God rather, is giving the law to Israel. It was the foundation for that uh, relationship between a nation and their God, that we are to love him. He even says with all of your heart. And we think about something like that, and we might ask the question, how can love be something that is commanded of people? And yet it is. That it's not the kind of relationship that you have a, a time where you're going through a dating phase with God. And then you decide whether or not you love him. That maybe there's an affection that's there, and then it grows into something more, and you call it love and devotion. This is something that's actually commanded of us. So what is it based upon? How do we know if we love God? Again, there's a commandment that's given there, but also in other passages like John 14, if you love me, Jesus said to his own apostles, you will keep my commandments. He said it to his apostles on the night that he was going to be betrayed and just before his crucifixion. They had been with Jesus for at least three years, hearing his teaching, going through the persecution that Jesus did, seeing people pick up stones, and want to stone him to death, seeing people wanting to push him off the edges of cliffs for the things in which he taught, knowing that Jesus had warned them about the scribes and the Pharisees and, and leaders of nations that they would stand before and knowing that they would have to give an account for the way in which they stood. And they stayed with Jesus, and yet Jesus still says that if you love me, keep my commandments. It wasn't just the idea that you stay close to me, that you feel a warmth and affection for me. Jesus says that if you love me, this is what you're going to be doing. You're going to be keeping my commandments. In verse 21, he says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. In verse 23 and 24, Jesus answered and said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So what Jesus makes clear in these passages, that if we do not love, if we are not keeping the commandments of God, we cannot say that we know God, and we cannot say that we love him. That it's only by keeping his commandments that those things are there. It is not an either-or choice. It is a matter that if you are keeping my commandments... 
Because there are times where the commandments of God, and we've talked about this a lot over the past few months, there are times where the commandments of God are hard and difficult, and it may be something that you do not want to do. But just as it is in any relationship that is correct, you still do that hard thing even when you don't want to do it because you know it is right. And our relationship with Jesus Christ, our relationship with God is based upon what is absolutely right. We can train our hearts. We can mold our conscience. We can bend our will. But it all has to be based upon this. I am going to serve the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I am going to be devoted to him, and I am going to love him. I'm going to do what he expects of me, not just when I like it or it, makes it, it feels good to me. It feels like a loving environment to me. I'm going to do it because it's what he expects of me. That's what loving God is all about. What about friendship? I think all of us would like to have a, a close enough relationship with God where we would feel like friends. We're told in John 15, verse 14, again, Jesus says, You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. Notice that difference that's there. The friend knows what the master is doing. The slave does not. So that relationship is based upon understanding some things. Jesus says, I've called you friends for all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. We have, it's been revealed to us what God is trying to accomplish, what God's will is in this world, that all men be saved, that all of us come to a, a knowledge of him, that we all have that kind of faith that's talked about in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, that without faith it's impossible to please him. We must believe that God is his reward of those who diligently seek him. Having that kind of faith, we understand some things about our God. And our God tells us through Jesus here, he tells us this very thing. You are my friends if you do the things that I command you to do. Ignoring my commandments, failing to tell the truth about God's word, failing to, to uh, fulfill the purpose that we have in this life to be shining as lights is not being a friend of God. It's actually being an enemy. <clears throat> Other passages teach us like James chapter 2, verses 21 through 23. <clears throat> and talking about Abraham. Was not our father Abraham justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Before this, was Abraham somebody who walked with God? We saw how much he left behind. We saw how much he sacrificed in leaving the land that he was in. We see how he went one way from another with, with Lot. So that Lot could choose the best of the land and Abraham went another way. We see the way in which people in foreign nations even honored Abraham for the way in which he lived his life. But it says here when he offered Isaac his son on the altar that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and has accounted him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. And the reason being is because when God told him to do something that seemed absolutely impossible something that knowing God, you wouldn't think God would ask. Why would God say, go sacrifice your son on an altar? That doesn't sound like God. That sounds like the other gods, the pagan gods, what they would do. Would a loving God, a God that I'm in a loving relationship with, ask me to do this thing? There were some things that Abraham understood. One of them was that he was not God, and he had no right to judge God. Another is everything that God asked for him to do was not going to negate the promises that God had made. And so even going and sacrificing Isaac on the altar, if he was to raise the blade and plunge it into his son and drain his blood from his body and burn him on that altar, God would, could raise him up again. When we think about friendship with God, it is really about trusting. It's having that, that kind of trust and relationship with God where whatever it is that God asked me to do, I'm going to do. A lot of congregations want to engage in things like discipline. When you have members who are not living the way that they should and the Bible commands that we separate ourselves from them and have no company with them. That doesn't seem like something in a lot of people's minds, knowing God, who's supposed to be a loving, faithful God, that God would ever ask us to do, and yet he does. Deliver such a one to Satan is the command that's given. Having a loving relationship with God would demand that. As friends of God, we may be asked to do that because there are things that we know. There's things we understand. Keeping the commandments of God is not talking about some just blindness where we just ignore or even make excuses for how God is or what God wants from us. 
It's about really having that kind of relationship that trusts him enough to do what it is that he tells us to do. Our faith is made perfect by that. It's one thing to say we believe. It's another thing to act on that belief. So if we want that right relationship with God, it has to be based upon that. Even when it comes to having a family type of relationship, feeling close enough to God to understand that we are a family. You remember in Matthew 12, verses 46 through 50, that Jesus is talking to the multitudes. He's been preaching and teaching. Some people think Jesus is crazy at this time. His family seem to be afraid for him and maybe want to pull him out of what they see as a dangerous situation. Behold, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. Then one said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But Jesus answered and said to the one who told him, Who is my mother and who is my brother? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. This is the ones that Jesus considers to be his close kin, his relatives. That if we really want to have that type of relationship with God, Jesus says, it's the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. First John 3, verse 10, And this to children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. John's words are strong. And it's interesting, too, because John is that disciple that we typically term as being the disciple of love. First John uses the word love like 50 times. And yet John is extremely intolerant of those who are being the hypocrite. He says that this is the way you know the difference between a child of God and a child of the devil. Which one is doing what it is that God says? He doesn't say the one who feels the most affection toward him. He doesn't say the one who feels and seems to be the most spiritually minded. He doesn't say any of that. He says there's a real simple test. The one who does the will of God is his child. The one who does not is a child of the devil. It's a real simple process. Scary, but very simple. It also is very convicting. Because again, I do believe that we all want to be close to God. Close enough that we can call Jesus our brother. That when we pray to God and call him our father, that we really get the, the import of what that means. But even in that relationship, it's based upon he who is doing that will. Ephesians 5 and verse 6 says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And as he writes these things to brethren... He says, this is who you could be. You may be one of the sons of disobedience when you're not keeping the commandments of, of our God. Fellowship. Well, at least let me just walk side by side with him. As it was in the Old Testament that Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Didn't see death because he was somebody who walked with God. So what does that mean? I think all of us understand and, and remember the verses that talk about fellowship. 1 John 1 verses 6 and 7. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, again, John is very intolerant. He says, you lie and you do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Again, the test is very, very easy. If we want to have fellowship with God, we have to actually be walking in the light. All this is to say this, is that really when we think about who we are with our God, we are indeed servants. And that word often has such a negative connotation to it because of all the horrible things that have happened. But when the Bible most of the time is talking about somebody who is a servant, some of your versions may have the term bond servant. And the reason it has that is because of the connotation that's being used. Paul, Peter, James, others in the scriptures use the term bond servant often at the beginning of the letters that they wrote. And the reason being is because a bond servant was someone who had a debt owed that he could not repay. And because of that, he would put himself into servitude of someone else until that debt was paid off. It may be that he died in service to this other person, and then his debt was considered paid off. But there was this debt that they could not repay, therefore they have entered into this relationship with another individual. All of our relationship is based upon, and this is where it starts, we know from the very beginning that there is a debt that is owed to God that we cannot repay. Every one of us, there's not a single individual in this audience who has not sinned and fallen short of the very reason for which you were created. You came forth from the dust of the ground with a spirit like God's for the purpose of glorifying him. And when we fall short of that, it says we fall short of the glory of God, the very reason for our existence. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. There is nothing that you can do to repay that. 
There were thousands upon millions of animals that were sacrificed, being burned on altars, blood flowing the streets, the smell rising up to the skies. And none of it was something that could get rid of sins. To demonstrate to us there is nothing within your power, even as the Old Testament prophet said, what do you require of me? The, can I give my children the, the flesh of my body? The, the oil, the animals, thousands of them. Can I do that to make up for what I've done? And then God just expects of us to do what is right, to love mercy. It makes no sense that a God that powerful, that mighty, that strong, who has went through such pains to let us know there's nothing that you can do to repay your sins, then says, come to me if you labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. We understand that that is a debt that we cannot repay. His son was put to a cross. We're reminded of it in the reading from Isaiah 53 tonight. Bearing the sins of, of mankind. He was put to the cross, brutally tortured. They hit him in the face. They put whips across his back. They put nails in his hands and his feet. They mocked him as he hung on the cross. As his blood dripped upon the ground, they took pleasure in every drop. There's nothing we can do to repay that. When we obeyed the gospel, that's what we were becoming, bond servants. That, Lord, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can bring. It's a debt I cannot repay. I trust you. I put my life into your hands. What would you have me to do? What would you have me to be? Let me do everything in my life to be pleasing to you. Because this incredible debt was not one that was going to cost me my reputation on this wor in this world. It was not something that was going to cause me to have to go through countless and sleepless nights that I might try to repay a physical debt. It was going to cost me my soul. And because of you, I can be in heaven with you throughout all eternity. There's nothing I can do to repay that. Let me be a servant. The prodigal son experienced that when he left his home and wasted all of his father's inheritance. And then when he came to himself and realized where he was at, he went back to his father and, said, and wanted to say to him, Father, just make me like one of your hired servants. And his father treated him like a son. He loved him. Now the son actually knew his father. All these things that we're looking for in that relationship with God is found in this idea. Make me a bondservant for you. That even in these relationships that exist on the earth with bond service, notice what it says. Bond service, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart, as to Christ, not with eye service, as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Paul reminds those who are bondservants, even in this world, that they have an obligation that is greater and mightier, and their role is different than even his fellow servant, because when he's serving even someone in the flesh, he should be looking to the bondservice that he owes to his God. In Romans 6, 16 through 18, the, the uh, spiritual application is this. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That even when you look at passages like this, it compares it to that relationship that we've been talking about. We obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which we were delivered, and we became slaves of righteousness, bond servants of righteousness, knowing who it is that we serve. You want to be close to God. You want to know God. You want to have a loving relationship with God. You want to have a family relationship with God. You want to be a friend of God. Then you have to obey from the heart that form of doctrine that delivers you. It is not about trying to find some secret feeling. It is not about some spiritual high that you get on. It is about coming to know who God truly is. The price that was paid for you, that was paid on your behalf, that you might have salvation. 
the punishment that was deserving of you, Jesus took upon himself. He was the one who was beaten. He was the one who was put to death for what was rightly our sentence. We can have that relationship if we're willing to submit. Matthew 6 verse 24 tells us you cannot serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or else you will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. In this context, he says, the thing that may cause you to be uh, divided against God is, is money. What is it for me that causes me to want something different? And so you can have that right relationship with God. If you realize that you're a sinner, that your sins have separated you from God, that there is no hope of eternal life because of where you're at. There's a debt that is owed that you cannot repay. Revelation 22, 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him who hears say, Come. Are you thirsty? Are you thirsty for that right relationship with God that is real? Not one that's based upon just your emotions. And we're not discounting emotions whatsoever. But if your relationship with God is based upon nothing but emotion, you're going to always find yourself thirsty. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God which lives and abides forever. God took that first step in giving us the right relationship with him. Our step is obedience from a heart that is desires to take of that water of life. He's the one who made the way available to us. And so I ask again the question I asked a little while ago, is your relationship with God, is it defined by what you want or is it defined by what God wants? The reason that we sometimes, I believe, feel empty is because I do very desperately, that is a real thing, I very desperately want a relationship with God, but I don't want to bend to his will. I want to keep for myself the things that I want to keep for myself, and I'm not willing to fully surrender. What we're talking about tonight is that relationship between obedience and that relationship, but really what we're talking about is the difference between life and death. Choose life. That's the invitation that God is giving. Choose life. The life that you have in Christ is much better than any life there is. Even if it's filled with persecution, hardship, and death. It is so much better. And that's amazing. And th but that's exactly how powerful the gospel is. So the question I'm going to leave with you tonight is this one. Is do you have that right relationship? If you don't, tonight is a night that that can change. We can get back on the right path. We can start down that path. If someone hasn't yet been baptized for the mission of your sins, you have an opportunity now. The, the waters are ready. We're ready to rejoice with the angels in heaven for any who would like to be a Christian. Nothing would please God more than to have another child added to his kingdom this very night. If we can help you in any way, please come as we stand and sing this song.